Hello and welcome to Kaus Live. We're coming to you from Hadi Asham. It's a wadi about 140 kilometers east of Jeddah. Uh, we're here today to speak with a number of KAUST researchers as well as collaborators from King Abdulaziz University about the research that they're doing and some of their inventions. So what made you come out to the desert and immediately think of hydrophobicity? Out of a casual conversation with a colleague of mine, I learned, uh, to my surprise, that agriculture, irrigated agriculture, was the biggest consumer of fresh water. This blew my mind because I used to think uh, growing far from agricultural communities, I used to think that uh, it was a domestic consumption of water, for instance, for cooking and bathing and so on. So when I learned that about 85% of all the fresh water in the world for last 50, 60, 70 years has been used just for growing food, I said, well, we could really do something about it. Uh, so we started thinking, what could we do uh, with something very cheap? So sand came as something. So I, I recollected that I wanted to do something with sand. So one obvious thing to do was uh, uh, my training. So where did hydrophobicity come in? During my postdoc, uh, I, I trained with a, a specialist on hydrophobic interactions. So I used to think of hydrophobicity from a molecular standpoint. What does it mean to put a hydrophobic molecule inside water? What's the environment? Where does hydrophobicity originate, etc.? cetera? Uh, so with that kind of a base, uh, we, we put some high purity chemicals, which were very, very water repellent on sand. And we saw, aha. Uh, now we have a very water repellent sand. So uh, we decided we could use it either as a barrier layer under the soil to stop percolation or we could put it on top in consultation with some colleagues. Uh, and that really started working. But then the cost was still very high because this high purity chemical was uh, one liter for $200. Uh, and then, you know, my students and I, we, we were going on a bike ride to the King Abdullah Monument and so on. And when we were coming back, uh, I said, well, let's stop at Tamimi and buy some candles. So that's how just out of uh, sheer serendipity and uh, just creative thinking, this came out, yeah. And can you describe the journey from, from that moment in Tamimi with the wax to where we are now, where you can put your hand and touch the sand that is having such an amazing effect? Uh, yeah, uh, it's been almost uh, two and a half, three years. What we started was an operation in our lab where we were making I don't know, 100 grams or so per day. Uh, our maximum production would have been a kilo uh, in, in a week or so. Now, this past year, we made 10,000 kilos of this material in our lab. Uh, what started as simple pot studies, now we are doing field-scale experiments with a variety of crops, uh, small plants and trees. Uh, trees both of uh, nutritive or food value and just for city greening applications. So I think we have come uh, a few steps uh, further from where we started. And although this is a special facility, the, the type of farm that this could be applied to is, is pretty much any, any in Saudi Arabia, isn't it? Absolutely. So the idea is very simple. When you're cooking food, let's say you're making pasta, and then after the cooking is done, you put a lid on top of your cooked food to prevent water from evaporating. This technology is so simple. It does exactly the same uh, function for you. You put our highly water repellent material, which we call either super hydrophobic sand or sandax or maybe some new name in the future, on top a thin layer, it just stops water from ev evaporating. It prevents the direct contact between the warm sunlight or a dry wind in dry areas from contacting the wet water. So there is more water in the soil uh, and uh, yeah in principle it can be applied to small plants plants in the field, plants inside home when you're traveling. It can be applied to date palms. It can be applied to any tree around you, this tree around you. Why not? And ultimately, what are you hoping? What's your dream to achieve here? So uh, we, hope, we hope that this uh, technology could be used for multiple applications, uh, agriculture being one of them. Uh, the profits in agriculture are not very high. So we are, as a result, we are targeting high value crops. So one thing has increasingly become clear during the course of last decade or so, as the global uh, groundwater resources have been declining, especially in dry regions where the recharge is rather limited. So if you keep pulling water out, if you're over consuming, you're not recharging them. Uh, but then it, is also it has also become increasingly clear that we cannot continue agricultural operations in the areas that are most conducive for agriculture. For instance, we cannot just usurp the whole Amazonia and grow plants there because that would really bring a catastrophe from a climate change point of view. So it has become increasingly clear that we ought to use areas that are dry, arid regions for agriculture. But 
And in those regions, uh, as the water table has been declining, this technology could be quite suitable. In addition to this, I think that uh, in dry areas, uh, you would like to have along your roads, green corridors, you would like to have public parks and so on. So all those green vegetation would benefit from this technology. And last but not the least, in coastal areas where roads get intruded by sea water from underneath and get damaged. So one could also envision the application of this material as a barrier layer. Tell us uh, what it is, practically speaking, that we're doing out here at the farm. So basically what we're doing is that we're growing tomatoes with this uh, new uh, technology that we dev developed in the lab, which basically is a sand, a typical sand from the deserts or from the beach that we collect, we make a process, and then it uh, repels water. I mean, if we pour water on top of it, it's not going to get wet. The water is not going to go in. So how do we use this sand actually? Uh, we take this water repellent sand and we put on top of the soil, only on top of the soil as a barrier. And basically what happens is that this barrier, this water repellent barrier is going to prevent the water that's coming from below the soil to evaporate. So typically what we do, we uh, use a subsurface irrigation that is buried in the soil and that provides water directly in the roots of the plants. So, of course, this water is going to get evaporated or the plant is going to use it. So what we're, doing, what we're doing here is that we are reducing the water loss through evaporation directly from the surface of the soil and we are providing more water for the plant to grow and to provide uh, fruits and yields. How are you testing exactly the effects of the sand versus not using the sand? So basically we have uh, several uh, fields and uh, we have the fields with the hydrophobic sand uh, with different thicknesses, uh, you know, varying from 5 millimeters to 15 millimeters. We also have the fields with no sand at all, just the bare soil. And we're also testing with the common uh, commercial technologies like plastic mulching. What have you found when you treat these plants with sand and give them sort of a normal amount of water? What, what are you seeing in terms of results? Okay, last year we, we tested uh, 5 millimeters of the sand and compared with uh, no sand at all under normal irrigation conditions. We're applying the same level of water for both the, the sand and the control fields. And basically we saw a 70% enhance in the fruit mass of tomatoes. And that was very significant, even with this minimum five millimeter layer of uh, sand on top. Uh, basically what we're doing is that we, with this uh, half centimeter, basically we reduce the evaporation rate by 64%. Uh, so that's just more water that stays in the soil and can be used by the plant. Have you tried uh, salt water versus non-salt water? Tell, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, for, for last season we actually had the part, half of the field was with uh, saline water. It was about 10% uh, of the concentration of seawater. And we also saw huge benefits of the hydrophobic sand. The way it works for salt water, it's basically the same. Since we are reducing the water evaporation from the soil, you know, when water evaporates, it leaves the salts behind. It doesn't take with a, as a vapor. So, you, you know, you, have, you are irrigating with saline water and that water is evaporating, so the salts are staying behind. So you're accumulating those salts. But if you have this layer of hydrophobic sand on top, that accumulation is reduced because of course we're having less evaporation. So uh, less of the salts are going to get accumulated. They actually percolate down below the root level. So you know the plant doesn't feel that much stress. So b basically we're comparing like what, what is it better in term, terms of saving water? Is it to have you know this 10% uh, seawater or is it better just to save fresh water? Those are the questions that we're looking forward to answer. And I guess the last sort of obvious question is then, how does the fruit end up tasting? Uh, have you seen a difference? Have you tried the tomatoes? Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, actually, uh, I mean, I don't have a good tasting myself, but uh, some friends that they came to the farm last year, they told us that the, the salty tomatoes, they, they tasted more like sweet compared to the freshwater tomatoes. So tell us a little bit about your relationship as a collaborating scientist with KAUST. Okay, we started collaborating with KAUST in, in 2015 when I started with Mark Tester in Wild Tomato. And at the same time, I started with Professor uh, Himen Shou uh, to test uh, his technology of uh, super hydrophobic sand in the field. 
It was the first time to test uh, this technology in the open field, and we tested with tomato and, and barley. You research lots of different um, um, specimens, onions, uh, broccoli, tomatoes. What's the thread that ties all of this research together? Um, in in, in Hanisham, we tried several uh, to producing several crops in, since I started here in 2010. So we started with faba bean, we started with onions, tomatoes, maize, uh, sunflowers. And uh, uh, through our cooperation with Kaust, um, we suggested some economical crops, which is more important for Saudis, to use the Kaust technology and enhance the crop productivity under Hadesham or under Saudi condition. Um, we have a specific condition here in, in Saudi Arabia in which limit productivity and, and number of crops suitable for agriculture, like saline waters, like lake water, like climates. We have a very short growing season in, in western region of Saudi Arabia, which started in October and in, in December. So with cows technologies, we could increase number of crops can be grown under this condition and also enhance productivity. What is special about uh, Hadi Asham? Like, tell us a little bit about this area that we're here in now. Well, this area is located um, about 140 kilometer uh, east, eastern from Jeddah. And um, we are here in KAU research station, which is about 100 hectares. And the Sham village was uh, specified for vegetable production um, 10 years ago when the water was available and water quality was acceptable for agriculture. But with uh, modern life and, and, and um, uh, starting some industries like uh, potable water, the water uh, reduced significantly and water quality highly affected. Uh, which forced us for searching for new technologies that help us using our available water uh, and our available land and these climates and produce uh, sufficient food for the community. Ten years seems in research time like an incredibly short amount of time. So look ten years ahead. What, what's the, f the future of this research here, you think? Um, uh, after ten years, I, I, I think the, the science will hold such areas uh, of dry climates and shortage in water. Um, with modern size, uh, science and good agricultural practices, farmers also can produce uh, uh, a good number of crops. Um, by using such hydrophobic sand to reduce evaporation and make the water available for the plants. And to use, uh, for example, microbes to help plants growing under lake of water and um, low quality of water, this will make this area available for agriculture also. So tell me how your technology influences the microbes in the soil. In our experiments we are working with the super hydrophobic sand mulch and uh, that is a lot of questions that we have been receiving from people for the past few years of this work. Uh, the concern of the people is about uh, the environmental and the health, uh, the health part of uh, the superhydrophobic sand mulch if it affects such components of the biotic communities. But basically what we have so far seen in our previous study, we had uh, in, our, in the previous season, we did uh, work with Professor Daniele uh, Defonkio in the Red Sea Research Center. And we were trying to analyze if there is any kind of effect of the, uh, uh, the sand mulch after wax coating on the microbial diversity. And after carrying out such a study, we realized that there is actually no effect. And that was actually one of uh, the points that we stood on because we saw that these wax that we are using is actually the common materials that people use in their domestic, uh, uh, in their home states. So basically when we carried out the experiment, we did not see any effect of the, uh, the sand mulch on microbial diversity. So in the trials where we had sand mulch and then the controlled soils, we realized that the microbial composition were not affected by the sand application. So that was something that we wanted to prove and our study with uh, Professor Defonkio De actually proved that to be uh, non-significant at all. So could you tell us a little bit more about the plants that you use? Previous experiment we worked with barley and tomatoes and uh, basically we realized that uh, in barley when we had uh, saline soil, uh, saline water, and then fresh water. 
there was actually no uh, effect of the sand mulch affecting microbial diversity. The same applies to the field that we had uh, like uh, fresh water. There was no uh, harmful effect of the sand mulch. So that proves uh, our point where we uh, expected that there would be no environmental uh, detrimental effect of the sand mulch on microbial diversity. So that in a way means if we are to consume uh, the tomatoes that we are having and other plants, we are actually at a safe position to eat these plants without any kind of consequences that may affect the health of human beings and also the soil uh, biology communities. That's all the time that we have here today. Thanks for joining us. Remember to comment, like, and share on all the KAUST social channels and from all of us at KAUST, thanks for joining us.